Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, you are in St. Helens in the future web track where we have three sessions. This morning there was one on intelligence and this afternoon we're going to focus on privacy and trust. We have two speakers for this session, Moni Naor and Jeffrey Freeberg. We're going to start with Moni and it's a great pleasure. I'll introduce them separately one at a time to first introduce Moni who is going to talk about pan privacy. So Moni comes from Israel, Weizmann Institute. You are also familiar with the US. You've been, uh, you spent quite a few times like doing your studies actually in Berkeley and many honors. And in the interest of time, I'm going to um, let you start now. Thank you. I'm going to talk about privacy of dynamic data, uh, continual observation and time privacy. This is a, a joint work with Cynthia Work, Tony Pitassi, Guy Rothblum, and Sergei Hanin. And a lot of this work was actually done at uh, Microsoft Silicon uh, Valley. And Cynthia and Sergei are there, and uh, Guy and Tony and I were uh, visiting. So, what is privacy? So it's really an extremely overloaded term and very hard to define even when you know what you want. And a lot of people who have actually tried to define it decided it's too complex and gave up. And I guess this is a, as good of a definition as you can get. Privacy is like oxygen. You only feel it when, uh, when it's gone. But still, I have to tell you what, given that it's an overloaded term, I have to tell you what's what aspect of privacy I'm going to talk about. So we know that there is lots of data around and uh, it's available to companies and to government agencies in the form of census data. And here, for instance, if you wonder whether uh, people are interested in privacy or not, here simply the law mandates uh, privacy and the law mandates that you not reveal uh, individual data. There is a huge database collected by uh, companies. It's known as the data deluge. Uh, there's lots of public surveillance uh, information from cameras, from RFIDs, from others. And uh, now, and more recently, social networks give you a lot of uh, information. And the, uh, the natural question is exactly what do you do in terms of privacy in all, with all this uh, information? So we know that statistical data analysis gives you, uh, can give you a lot of uh, benefits. You can find correlations, for, in, for instance, in medical studies. You can provide better services uh, in web search and fit ads to queries, which has, uh, certainly has uh, social values. You have to publish official statistics, uh, data mining, of course. but. Data contains confidential information, and almost any usage of the data that is not carefully crafted will leak something about it. And definitely, if we have better uh, privacy, we'll have, we expect to get be better data from uh, people. So here is, an, uh, here is a bad example, uh, pretty famous, the AOL search history release. So a few years ago, uh, AOL decided to release uh, its, its search log for the goal was to provide real query logs from real users, which were not available at that time. And what they did is they removed what they thought was identifying information. They, whenever there was a, a username, they replaced it with, with their, uh, an identifier. But different searches to the same, uh, by the same user were still linked. And it didn't take uh, long until someone, uh, 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 until the, the New York Times managed to find an actual, a specific user whose complete 
search history uh, was revealed. Uh, it was uh, a lady, uh, Thelma Arnold, and uh, she did a lot of interesting searches, as you can see. And, um, and she also had a good explanation for it. And uh, of course, once you, once you know, uh, one, once you have someone's search history, given that people do vanity searches and various other reasons, it's not that difficult to figure out uh, who they are. So this is a bad example, simply removing the name of an individual from, from uh, the search is not a, a, it's not a good way to preserve privacy. So it is a, it is a hard question. It is a hard question the, uh, how to do uh, how to do how to gain privacy when you have uh, public data analysis. And what we are interested in is getting the utility of, of statistical analysis while protecting the privacy of every individual participants. And uh, still we want, uh, we want the sort of the sanitized data that we'll provide to allow reasonably accurate answers to, me, to, um, and to meaningful uh, queries. And one question is whether it's possible at all to define this goal uh, and to define and achieve it in any meaningful way. And the best answer that we have for that was actually suggested by Microsoft researchers, by uh, Dwork, McSherry, Nassim, and Smith. Uh, Dwork, McSherry are at Microsoft. Nassim and Smith were visiting at the time. Uh, Nassim actually is also at Microsoft now. Uh, and they defined uh, differential privacy. So what the, the definition of differential privacy protects individual participants. So you have, uh, on, the on the red, you have uh, some sort of data. You have a curator or a sanitizer that wants to produce uh, some sanitized version of it, like the AOL, what AOL did by removing real names, but of course in a, in a good way. So the sanitizer produces the green version uh, on, on the right. And the idea, the definition of the differential privacy talks about the difference between a database and a database plus an individual. And the goal is that the, the, it will be hard to distinguish between the case where the individual, uh, the, the added individual is in the database and it is in the case where it is not in the database. Okay, so these two cases should look similar uh, given the, the, the sanitized version. It will be hard to say whether that individual is in the database or not. So, um, in particular, what it means that is we want we want is the probability of every bad event, any event or any event. We, we it's not doesn't have we don't have to say what is bad. So uh, the probability of any event increases only by a small a small multiplicative factor when that individual enters the database as compared to when it is not in the database. And therefore, from that individual's point of view, he may as well participate in the database if he doesn't reveal uh, if, if, if its uh, participation cannot be deduced from their output. So a little more mathematically, what we want is that for all databases D, for all individuals me, for all possible outputs T, the difference, oh, oops, you can see some problems with Microsoft, the two should have been in. Uh, <laughs> So the probability that the output of the sanitizer is in some, belongs to some subset T versus uh, when the individual is in the database versus the probability that, uh, that it is, uh, the output is in T when it is not in the database, that should be between uh, uh, e, to the uh, to e to the minus epsilon and E to the epsilon. So roughly one plus uh, epsilon. So that's uh, epsilon differential privacy. Epsilon cannot be too small, it cannot be negligible uh, for those of you with a crypto background, uh, but uh, think of a small constant, that's uh, the best way. So just to familiar, uh, familiar ourselves with this notion, let's see an example of what is not differential privacy. So let's say we have a very simple database, again the, again, the two is a in. Uh, so we have a set of uh, uh, x of uh, names uh, of a database that is a name and a tag which is zero or one. 
and we really want to release a single query, uh, uh, which is the number of participants where, where the tag is one. So here, here is something that is typically done in, in many cases, and that's release a few random tuples with no name. Okay, so you do a sampling and remove the, you, do, you sample and remove the name. So that is actually not differentially private because we ha because suppose that uh, there is only a single individual with a with a tag is one and all the rest are zero. In this case, he has some probability that he will be in the output. Let's say one over n or some small constant over n, where n is the number of participants. So if he's in the database, the probability of having a one in the in the sample is one over n, but if it's not in the database, the probability is zero. Therefore, we have no, uh, no differential privacy for any uh, epsilon. So s sampling and releasing information about, an, uh, uh, sampling and simply releasing that information is not uh, differentially private. On the other hand, what we can do is add the noise which, uh, which is carefully uh, designed, and this is, uh, <coughs> this is what we'll actually do you can do a lot, and that is we add noise chosen. We simply output the number of ones plus noise, and the noise is chosen from a Laplacian distribution with parameter one over uh, epsilon. So it's like the exponential dis uh, uh, distribution, but uh, symmetric. And the key property, the key nice property of, of uh, the Laplacian distribution is the probability that the noise is uh, k minus one is something like e is e to the epsilon times the probability that the noise is k. So uh, differences by one are exactly absorbed by uh, by uh, by this. The, the, be the best you can do if you if you want to know whether an individual is in the database or not, the best uh, your best uh, the best. Uh, bias you can get is e to the epsilon. So this is a, a good trick. So we can release, uh, we can always add noise which is distributed according to, to this uh, distribution and uh, not uh, cause too much damage. Now, um, the desirable properties that, that we want from a sanitization mechanism is, the, is composability. So if you apply the sanitization several times, you have some sort of graceful degradation. And in fact, uh, uh, epsilon differential privacy has exactly this property. So if you release, if you make Q releases, um, each of them uh, epsilon differentially private, then you'll get uh, Q times epsilon differential privacy, privacy altogether. So you have to set epsilon, of course, accordingly, if you know that they are Q. So other notions, for instance, of uh, the try to protect uh, privacy have, do not have this property if you know about canonymity. If you release it twice, you, you may be gone, completely gone. And then robustness to site information, we don't need to specify exactly what the adversary knows. We said it knows everything except whether, the, whether that individual is in the database or not. Okay. So, um, so now, uh, what um, the questions that we considered is what happens if the data is dynamic? So we want to handle situations where the data keeps changing. And not all the data is available at the time of sanitization. So we have part of the database coming and then you have to perhaps output another part comes and then you have to output something else, et cetera. So we still want to have differential privacy in such cases and think of, one example is think of Google Trends, uh, like for instance, they like to advertise the fact that they can uh, track uh, what happens with the flu. So they give from their query log, they, they, they want to, to produce, uh, the, the, they want to report the popularity of various queries at uh, any point in time. And from that, presumably you can deduce where, where the flu, uh, where there is, whether, where, whether the, where there is a, whether there is a flu epidemic, where the flu epidemic appears, etc., and uh, therefore the, the data that they have, the number of queries about uh, about flu-related um, uh, keywords, that keeps changing in time. That always changes, and they don't know all the data when they're producing it. So they cannot. It's not the, the original picture we had in mind, but the, 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 the latter picture where the data uh, keeps coming in and you want to output uh, to make some sort of output. So now there are lots of uh, <coughs> questions that come up. So one issue is continual observation. The adversary gets to examine 
the, uh, the output of the sanitizer all the time, not just at the end. Or another issue is what we call pan privacy. And here, the issue, it's more general than just uh, Google Trends. The point is that there can be re times where the adversary gets to examine the internal state of the sanitizer. Perhaps it broke in into the, into the system, or perhaps it got a subpoena. So we have to consider what happens, what, what exactly we're storing about individuals, even in the internal state, not only, about the, not in, only in the, the output. And another issue that comes up is what exactly are we protecting? What is the unit that we're protecting? What is an individual? Is it an event level or user level? I'll demonstrate it more uh, in, more, in more detail la uh, later on. And the, the issue, the point is that now, given that uh, the, the data keeps changing, it's much less clear what, what exactly is a, an individual. You can't simply sort them together. Uh, you have to say things more uh, explicitly. So let's talk about continual output observation. So the data is a stream of items, and the sanitizer sees each item and updates it in an internal state and produces an output observable to the adversary. The adversary is the the entity that tries to decide whether an individual is in the database or not. So here we have the, um, here we have the, the stream, and uh, here we have uh, the state of the sanitizer. The sanitizer reads the first part of the stream, and sanitizes and produces an output, and changes its internal state accordingly, and so on. So, it, it, it reads something, produces an output, and changes its state, and so on. Uh, so at the first cut, what we're, what the unit that we're protecting is one square. Later on, the, this is the event level. And later on, the, the user level, think of it that we're trying to protect a color, trying to protect all the yellow ones, or all the, whether there is a yellow one in the, in the stream or not, whether there is a green one in the stream or not. But right now, we're talking about protecting just a, a one square. So in a continual uh, observation, we're, again, interested in differential privacy. And uh, uh, we are talking about adjacent to data streams, with, where we can get from one to another by uh, changing a single uh, element. And uh, as before, we say that an algorithm or a sanitizing algorithm is a epsilon differentially private against continual output. If for all adjacent uh, data streams, S and S prime, for all possible prefixes the, uh, and uh, prefix of the outputs, sigma one up to uh, uh, sigma t, the, the, the ratio between the probabilities whether in, in, uh, of these two streams, of these two adjacent streams, is between e to the minus epsilon and e to the epsilon. And here is a, and here is a simple problem um, that uh, we can do, which is a counter. Let's say that we have a counter. Think of uh, YouTube. You, on YouTube, you can see how many people watched a certain video. And uh, this, in general, you, you may think that because it's an aggregated number, <coughs> then it's safe to release. But in general, this is a very dangerous thing to, to have exact uh, numbers. It's always a dangerous thing. Just think of a simple database. If you allow two queries, I, uh, in general, I, one query where one query which includes me and another query we, but includes me together with a very large set and another query which just includes that large set but without me then of course by subtracting the two results if it's a let's say a counting query you'll be able to deduce uh, my value so in general giving accurate results is always a very dangerous thing so here we're trying we're trying to to have a counter like in YouTube that will not, would not reveal let's say whether I've watched the video or not you've sent me a a link to the video, and you're interested in, in knowing whether I've w watched that video or not. And if you follow the counter, you, if, you, if no precaution is made, then you may be able to deduce whether I've watched it or not. So the question is, how can we, so we have a stream, a zero one stream, it's relatively sparse, it's the number of, and we want to o always have a publicly observable counter that approximates the number of ones seen so far. And um, at each point, at each uh, time period, the output would, should, be, uh, the, should, should be close to the total uh, number of ones. 
And as I said, we want to hide the individual inference while providing a, a reasonable accuracy. Okay, so here is um, an example. We have, uh, uh, we, we've seen one, we have to output something. Let's say we output one. We still output one, we still output one. Here, um, we output two. And uh, of course, so th this was a completely, in this case, it was a completely accurate one, but we want to mask this so that the adversary would not be able to deduce when the increments uh, occurred. So uh, here is um, so here is a simple idea. It, think of each time period you have input which is either zero or one. Output the counter by input xi, and add. We saw that Laplacian noise is so good. Add Laplacian noise with magnitude one over epsilon. So uh, we'll have privacy since uh, each increment is protected by Laplacian noise. We'll get, uh, uh, it will actually be differentially private whether x i is zero or one. So that from privacy point of view, it's good. What about accuracy? Well, the accuracy of the noise cancel out. We're going to have, if we have a sequence of length capital T, then we're going to, to uh, add T such things. It will cancel out, but we'll still have an error of square root of T. Now remember that this is a relatively sparse sequence. So square root of t, square, t, capital T is the total number of the time periods. So square root of t could be a pretty large number, uh, given that we have sparse things. So we want to do, some, we want to do better than uh, square root of t. And why were we so accurate? Essentially, uh, we operated completely uh, as I'll say a little more about randomized response, but we acted exactly as in randomized response. We didn't utilize at all the fact that we do have a state, that the, we do have an internal state, maybe even an external one, but definitely an internal state. We, each each uh, data item was com treated completely independently. And we acted exactly the same in cases where the data was sparse and when, when it was dense. And uh, of course, we have to be very careful because the times when the counter is updated are uh, potential leakage. So here is an idea that can improve it quite substantially. Uh, the idea is to apply a conversion from a static algorithm into a dynamic one. So we'll have many, we'll have many accumulators that run in parallel. And uh, each one of them counts the number of ones in a fixed segment of time plus some noise. So each accumulator is in charge of a particular segment, a segment which is set ahead of time. And of course, uh, w when we actually use it, we'll use it plus noise. The value of a counter at any point in time is a sum of accumulators of a few segments. Okay, so accumulator is measured, uh, 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 the accumulator accumulates when the segment goes on, but then when it is finished, only then it is going to be, it is used only when, when, when the segment that it measures is uh, completed. So um, the accuracy depends on the number of uh, segments in the summation and the accuracy of the, of the accumulators. So at any point in time, what we sum up to, to say, uh, to, to give our estimate at any point in time, we're going to sum up a few, hopefully a few, because it, affects the accuracy, but we're going to sum up a few accumulators and say uh, the given time. So uh, the privacy depends on the number of accumulators that the point influences. So for accuracy, we want each, uh, we want each, uh, each point in time to be expressed as a sum of a few uh, segments. And for privacy, we want each point in time to intersect um, a, a few segments. So these are uh, contradictory. Re, uh, requirements, somewhat contradictory, and the best uh, we can do is uh, based it on uh, the bit representation of, uh, of the time t. So each um, point in time uh, participates in, in, in uh, something like uh, uh, log t segments, and, um, and the sum at each point in time is going to be the sum of at most log t accumulators. Okay, so, <coughs> uh, 
So each, so we'll have segments for each, for every power of two, we'll have a, we'll have a segment. And we want, when we want to sum up it, it and we want, when we want to sum up a given point, we look at the, at the bit representation and choose the segments accordingly and, uh, and get the sum. So, so again, we have to sum at most log t segments and each point participates in at most log t uh, segments. So uh, if we set uh, epsilon prime to be something like epsilon over uh, log t, ignore the one over four, uh, we can get, uh, we can get uh, the desired privacy. We'll get uh, epsilon privacy, so we have to reduce epsilon to by a factor of log t. And in terms of ac accuracy, we'll get the accuracy instead of square root t that we had before, something like log to the 1.5 t uh, over epsilon. Because again, we'll have uh, some cancellation. So we, ha we can have a counter, the conclusion is that we can have a counter with a reasonable accuracy uh, in, this, uh, in this way. So the the, the, we'll have epsilon differential privacy and the ac accuracy would be something like log to the 1.5 t. And actually log t is the, is the best you can do. We don't know exactly what happens between log t and log to the, uh, the 1.5 t. Okay, so this is, this is an example of something you can do with a continual output. Now once you have a counter, you can do lots of things with a counter. I'm not going to to tell you thing, uh, uh, much about it, I'll just mention, for instance, you can do aggregations of expert advice while keeping the expert opinion uh, private. So you can run the learning algorithm that aggregate expert advice while keeping what the actual expert said uh, privately. So let's talk about uh, the other issue, the pan privacy. So usually the data curator is trusted. But of course, even well-intentioned curators or sanitizers are, sub are subject to uh, mission creep, to subpoena, to security breach, to lots of other things. And, uh, and you can think of various examples, stories, uh, like uh, not necessarily bad one from uh, the law-abiding citizen's point of view, like the story of a base professional baseball player a collection of uh, drug tests that was uh, su supposed to be a secret, but was actually subpoenaed, etc. So the curator accumulates statistical information, but should never store sensitive data. So at any point in time, even if its state is leaked, it shouldn't be too disastrous. That's the goal. And again, that would reassure individuals that they, they, they have no reason to fear from participating in, uh, from the data being in that uh, setting, because. Even if things go wrong, it can't be too bad. And uh, we call this property pan privacy because the algorithm is private both inside and out. Um, so, random, so there is an example of such a thing and that's called the randomized techniques of Stanley Warner from the mid 60s where he decided, uh, where he designed a method for polling stigmatizing uh, questions. The idea is that you ask the participants to lie with known uh, probability. So the specific answers are somewhat deniable, but the aggregate results are still valid. And uh, the data is never stored in the clear, and this, uh, this, really te this technique um, is very popular nowadays in the database uh, literature, starting from the, uh, the work of Agrawal and Srikant, and more recent work by Mishra and, um, oops, forgot the other. Uh, so the good thing here is that you don't have to trust the curator because it never stores. You, you just add the noise yourself. The individual adds the noise himself. Uh, the point is that it's good only for very limited type of tasks. In particular, if the same individual appears in this picture several times, then, then the privacy is gone because he, you will be able to, to average out the noise that he adds. And also it's clear that you can do very limited, it's, well maybe it's not so clear, but you can show that you can do only relatively limited amount of computation in this sort of, the individual himself has to add the noise and you get no chance of uh, interacting. 
But we're, we're interested in more complex uh, things. So in particular, think of it, think of our, we, that we have a stream of usernames and query, qu uh, query as in search query. And we do not want to expose anything about a particular user, on, and, uh, and not only about a particular user query pair, but about a particular user. So the fact that we want to hide all the, all the queries that the user, specific user, issued is the user level. If we were only uh, hiding a particular pair of user query, then it would have been event level. So of course, uh, doing a user level is more challenging given that we don't want to store anything private. But actually you can do, uh, the issue is can you do any sort of aggregation without storing sensitive data? And, um, and the answer is that yes, you can do some things. You can definitely do some interesting things. We don't quite know, we don't have a good characterizations of what you can do, but definitely you can do some interesting things. So again, in the pan privacy model, as before, the, the data is a stream of items. Uh, the, the sanitizer reads them one at a time. And we're now, because we are interested in user level protection, we're trying to hide all similar colored uh, squares. So we want to hide all the information in the blue squares or all the information. We, it shouldn't be able, given the output or given the internal, given the output and the internal state, uh, it shouldn't be possible to determine whether the blue, uh, whether the blue um, uh, uh, squares appeared at all or not. Okay, so uh, the, uh, for every possible behavior of a user in, this, in the stream, the joint distribution of the internal state at any single point in time, and the final, well, we're also interested in continual observation. In the final output or all the, all the possible outputs should be differentially private. We can also talk about multiple intrusions, not a single intrusion, but let's concentrate on a single intrusion. That's bad enough. And uh, so as we said, we're talking about adjacency where you have two streams and two streams are considered adjacent if you can get to the same st uh, stream by dropping a single uh, by dropping a, a, a single letter. Okay, so, um, so now we are, so the definition is as before for any two adjacent streams, any, and any, but now we, we get not only the output, but also the internal state in some, at some particular point in time. And here is something you can do, something interesting you can do. You can, let's say, evaluate the density or the number of distinct elements in your stream. So you shouldn't keep, you should keep the identity of the, of the elements secret, of the elements secret, and you don't want to overcount. You're not simply counting the number of squares you have, but you, you want to, color, to count the number of different colors that you have. Um, and, um, and, you, and given the internal state, to, it should still be hard, uh, uh, internal state at any point in time, not all internal state, but the internal state at a particular point in time, it should still be difficult to determine uh, uh, whether a particular individual existed or not. Okay, so just think of it that you're trying to estimate the number of distinct users who searched for the term, for the term flu. So various things do not uh, work here in this sort of setting. You, you, you simply cannot store the names, etc. Uh, because it's bad for privacy, also for space. <coughs> and simple sampling also is not good, good enough. Sampling is not good enough for privacy. It's good enough because you, you don't want people to complain after the fact, oh, I've been sampled, why is, why is all my data exposed? And then, of course, they can sue you. Okay, so here is, here is something you can do. So think of it. Um, that uh, you come to an elevator, and um, you come to an elevator, and you want to, uh, and, and if you don't press the button, the elevator will arrive after a certain amount of time. If you press the button, it will arrive, uh, af pro hopefully, after less time. It will have a, a different distribution. But what happens if you press again and again? Well, I'm told that it doesn't help. That. <laughs> 
once you can change the distribution once. So this is the idea here. So initially, so we'll have, again, this is, we start with having a bit for each potential user. Of course, later on we'll sample, et cetera, and get better things, but think of it for each user, we'll have a single bit BX. For each user X, we'll have a single bit BX. The initial distribution of that bit is zero or one with probability half. After we encounter x, each time we encounter x, we, re we redraw bx, but with a slightly different distribution. We'll have zero with probability half, half minus epsilon, and one with probability half plus epsilon. Okay, so th that we don't, when we encounter x, we don't look at all at bx, we simply redraw uh, bx according, we redraw bx according to the second distribution. And the final output is the fraction of ones in the, the fractions of one in the table minus half over epsilon plus uh, noise. That's how what we make is uh, our output. This is, think of it that we have just a single output. So the, the claim is that this is pan-private. Okay, so we have this is the first distribution D0, the second distribution D1. And the reason this is a pan-private is that, okay, so if a user never appeared, its entry is drawn from D0. If it appears, no matter how many times it appeared, its distribution is drawn according to D1. D0 and D1 are four epsilon differentially private. And this is the reason why the whole thing is, um, is actually pan-private. You cannot tell uh, what it is uh, at the end. No, actually, I said um, answer at the end. Okay. So, um, uh, so uh, you can actually get, as I said, you can get improved accuracy in storage uh, and multiplicative accuracy instead of additive accuracy and also uh, small uh, storage. So, uh, so the den for the density here, we can get um, uh, for the density example, we can get epsilon differential privacy with uh, error alpha, with multiplicative error alpha in space which is proportional to polynomial one over epsilon and polynomial one over uh, alpha. We can do other things like uh, estimate uh, the number of users that appear exactly k times or a cropped means the, the number of users where that appeared uh, uh, a certain number of time or maximum of a certain amount of time or minimum uh, a certain amount of time. We can estimate the number of uh, heavy heaters, th th those that appeared more than uh, k times. So these are all examples of things we can do. And th then there are things that are actually hard to do. But uh, as I said, we don't have a, a, a characterization or a good uh, hint of what, what is it that uh, makes a difference between uh, being able to do it pan privately and not. For continual output, we do have a general transformation that will at least take all uh, non-sensitive function and will produce a, a continual output version of them. Okay, so what we get is essentially a dynamic privacy zoo or a petting zoo with lots of different criteria. We have, we have all possible differentially private. The whole thing is differentially private. We have differential privacy under continual observation. We have pan privacy, and these are somewhat orthogonal. We have in the, interse not the intersection, or in their intersection, it's not the intersection, we have things that are pan private under uh, continual uh, observation and under continual intrusions. Then we have things that are, in, and in, inside it, we also have things that behave more like the, we call it the sketching model, the private sketching model that, be, that things that behave like, a, a, like the randomized response. And, all the, uh, the, uh, and more or less everything and you can see in this picture, you can separate everything that is not equal, you can actually uh, separate. And, uh, oh, and then there is the issue of user level um, privacy, which is again orthogonal to, to the rest. And you can read these things in uh, those papers that are available, I guess, in various places on my webpage, in the Microsoft webpage, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. So, so maybe we can take one question as we transition speakers. 
Uh, we need a mic. Oh, it's okay? Oh, okay. So, a quick question or? Here, in the front, please. Oh, actually, hold on. I have a question on the remark you made in the middle that if the user resubmits its answer many times, then it becomes sort of less private. But that's only true if I redraw my coin, right? Because if I just decide with probability one half minus epsilon to lie and then consistently lie after that, no privacy is lost. Right. In this case, uh, in this case, no privacy is lost. But you, it means that uh, every browser that you'll you you will use, you'll have to use uh, the same uh, coins. And also, whenever you change a little your query, I guess, so, yeah. so you can simply decide that you are the lying type, and that's it in life for the rest of your life. But then, of course, you'll be able will be able yeah, to sure. detect it uh, otherwise. Right, thank you. And of course, money will be on the boat where we expect all of you tonight, so you can continue the conversation there. Thank you, money. So we're going to go, we just talked, money talked about privacy, and another very important uh, topic is even if everything is uh, private, what do people think about it? What's the user experience? And, and that gets us into the trust um, talk that Jeffrey is going to talk about. Jeffrey, uh, short introduction, as you take the time, we'll, uh, we have a break after, we can take a couple more minutes. So Jeffrey is the Chief Trust Architect here at Microsoft. Your background is in computer graphics. So you could have been working on Kinect too, maybe. But no, you went to privacy and now you've been working on the end-to-end -end trust. And please start. Thank you. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> One of the visions around end-to-end -end trust is uh, to create a, a safer, more trusted internet. And whenever I mention the, that kind of concept to people, two uh, reactions I typically get. Uh, yeah. Uh, one is that uh, it's intractable. Uh, the other one is that it's boiling the ocean. Uh, both are probably somewhat true. Uh, but that doesn't deter me from at least trying to find ways to improve the level of trust that we enjoy on the internet. So I want to share with you some of the methodologies that we're using to go about that task. Uh, and within that area, there's uh, one that's a particular, I'm particularly fond of, which has to do with the usability issues of security and privacy features. So I work in the Trustworthy Computing Group. And in a nutshell, I'd have to say what we do is we're a corporate level group that helps the company do the right thing. Um, so we focus on things like uh, establishing uh, security foundations, uh, the privacy standards, reliability. Uh, there's other things that are in this group at this point, including things like accessibility, uh, geopolitical correctness, and even the green initiatives at the company. So I really have no problem getting up in the morning, because every time that I do, I feel like I'm doing something to improve things uh, and trying to keep people honest. So uh, the path to end-to-end -end trust has actually been quite uh, long for us. Um, I'll just provide a brief history. Uh, back in 2002, we had a major push to try to improve the security of our uh, features and systems. And that uh, turned into the Security Development Lifecycle, the SDL, which is available publicly. You guys can take a look at it. It's, uh, you know, methodology and process for making more secure products, a uh, pretty critical improvement uh, to software development. Uh, I had a lot of uh, opportunity to help on the privacy side, which that also turned into uh, a standard for how we do privacy and software development, um, and also an optimized process for how do you do that with 17,000 developers and actually trying to get them to do the right thing. Uh, in that same time frame, there were all sorts of attacks that we were dealing with, everything from spyware to phishing, uh, and it ultimately turned into identity theft. Uh, we sat down and, and did some deep analysis trying to figure out the root causes of these things. Uh, and in the process, I also created this visualization called the Internet Battlefield that uh, a number of people have found useful to see how all the bad things are happening. And then as you deploy tactics, what kind of efficacy could you expect out of them? Then in uh, 2007, we actually uh, kicked off an actual group to focus on uh, some of the usability issues on security and privacy. 
Uh, we call this Tux internally at Microsoft. It's short for the trust user experience. This is any time you're placed in the hot seat to make a trust decision. Uh, so a team was formed and also an advisory board. In 2008, um, the VP of our group, uh, Scott Charney, actually wrote a seminal white paper uh, about end-to-end -end trust. And that's something I'll go into a little bit and talk about the ramifications of that. In 2008, we also kicked off a team to actually go off and try to deliver on the uh, vision that was espoused in the paper. Uh, and in 2009, um, I took over the group and we have been focusing on other tools and mechanisms to try to get a little further along, uh, given how hard and how challenging the problem is. So I'll share some of that work with you here as well. So in the paper, um, if you've ever had a chance to read it, and it's available on the website, there's a link at the end, uh, there was a general uh, sentiment around the need for greater privacy and security on the internet. There's no great surprise. And clearly, having uh, richer connectivity leads to greater uh, ability to find targets. That could also be very valuable, which then spreads and you know, fuels the cyber crime. Um, and a lot of people were lamenting about just how anonymous the criminals were and, and just how with impunity they go about doing what they're doing. And, and so it really comes down to the traceability and accountability. So the paper called for a couple of key things. Um, one is the need for greater accountability. Uh, and in many places where people focus on identity theft, there's always this desire to know who's who. Uh, this all stems back from you know, the internet missing the identity layer during its initial development. And ever since then, we've been trying to catch up, trying to put extra capability in so you know that you're not a dog on the internet. right? Um, and having some kind of useful trust framework would be uh, important as well. And it's important to note that when you're dealing with the greater accountability, you just want to make sure you don't do that in the wrong way, such that you start eroding the personal freedoms we've all come to enjoy. Because uh, we don't want this to become a police state just simply because we want to find the bad guys. So this is sort of the challenge that uh, surrounds this kind of, uh, kind of work. So in the paper, there was a, this trusted framework was uh, proposed. And uh, at the bottom, uh, you have the security, you have the foundations layer which uh, provides both you know, basic security capabilities like the SDL, defense in depth, threat mitigation, and we also dovetailed privacy into the SDL as well. At the top, you have a lot of the missing pieces that were called out earlier about identity, uh, everything from authentication, authorization, access to moving to more of a claims-based system, um, and also something that anchors people in real life, some kind of in-person proofing. Uh, this is something that we don't enjoy in any ubiquitous way today. <laughs> Uh, and only in small pockets do we get in-person proofing, and so we have a real lack of knowing whether we're really dealing with the other entity that we expect. Uh, there's always this, uh, in the center is really the core. It, it uh, presents a trusted stack. At the bottom, obviously, if whatever hardware you're using is suspect, all bets are off. So we've seen cases in the supply chain where disks are coming preloaded with viruses, and you know, we're kind of worried about what other chips are there on the keyboards and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, supply chain and that's all is very critical. So getting secure hardware is very important. So now we have things like the TPM and other things that can start to make assertions about uh, certain trust uh, statements being made by the system. Later on top of that, of course, is trusted software. We can all spend a lot of time talking about how this can uh, be better architected um, and where it comes from. Uh, trusted data, you know, whether it's been modified in transit, you know, does it still have its integrity? And of course, at the top, the trusted people. And, and this also includes trusted devices and trusted entities. And clearly, as more and more things connect, everything from the smart grid and everything else, you're going to have to know what level of, of trust you have for the various devices. Another thing that was brought up in the paper was that things won't happen within the ecosystem to make this vision a reality unless there's alignment of some key forces, in particular, economic, political, and social forces. A simple example is if there might be a great technology that might solve a problem, but if a person couldn't make money at it, it may not happen. Uh, or there is a really cool technology and someone wants to make it, but unfortunately you lose your personal freedoms when you do it, so there's this big backlash. Uh, you know, and finally, there's some kind of missing support in the public policy space for getting certain things to happen. In some cases, you need regulation to actually stimulate some of the work to happen if there's not an actual economic uh, force to uh, make that occur. So getting these into alignment is really the tricky business of a lot of what we do. I can honestly say in the rest of my talk, I do not have a single epsilon. 
or anything like that. It's, it's really the, the hard work of trying to get different people from different places, people who know the smart technology and people who know about policy and people who want to actually spend time doing standards, getting together to make forward progress to make this, uh, this happen sooner. So if you looked at the paper, it was kind of, it was inspirational. A lot of people picked it up and especially people in the, in the public policy space looked at it too and they said this is kind of cool. But it really didn't lay out a, 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 any kind of schedule of, a, a, and, and kind of a, a list of who was going to do which piece. So when it was thrown in my lap, it seemed natural that maybe what we could do at least to move things on a little bit was to apply some things we already know how to do, like program management of projects. We do a lot of projects here, so we're pretty good at that. Uh, we said, well, why don't we apply the standard techniques and let's create a roadmap of what needs to get done. At least that would give us some kind of framing and a place to have a discussion. Because maybe we don't know the right order to do things and maybe we're missing some key building blocks. Uh, maybe there's certain research that needs to get done. Uh, and if people don't see that stuff early enough, it might be five, ten years before we see some of the big movements that need to be made. So with respect to roadmaps, why would you do them? Um, I'm, I'm really fond of creating visualizations that help all the people in the ecosystem see the big picture. You need to be able to say, oh, I'm here, and it's my job to do this piece, and oh, I depend on this other person, and if they don't get their piece done, my piece isn't happening, and vice versa. I might be upstream, you know, downstream from someone else that needs my piece. So getting people to see what piece they need to have and how it, you can demystify all those, those, all those different dependencies. We can start doing the critical path analysis. Uh, in particular, things like getting new public policy in place or creating new standards. I think many of us who have done that kind of work know how long it takes to do. So getting that stuff started early is really critical. And if people knew what it was for and, and what it was feeding into, it could, might uh, stimulate some of that work to happen. I'm also really kind of uh, intrigued by are there a bunch of projects people are already doing where the building blocks can be re reused, where there's key components that get used in other scenarios that people didn't quite realize. Um, so all of that's really important. And of course, the ability to collaborate uh, is also very critical. So another uh, piece is that to the extent that people aren't recognizing that there's something they can do, make some kind of insightful call to action, that there's actually some specific missing piece that needs to get started, and maybe you can actually get them to, uh, to think about it. So we do a lot of what we call inspiring and enabling. We don't actually build it necessarily, but we hopefully get other people to realize the opportunity. Uh, and then you can also use these maps to track progress. So what do we think of when we build roadmaps? I think the easiest way to, to build one out um, is to start with something really high level, like an initiative of some kind, something that can help frame the discussion and maybe get some people in an audience to say, oh yeah, that's me, I kind of care about that. So there's a couple of big initiatives you can pick on, and I'll list a couple later. But one of them could be like online healthcare. You know, everybody, you tell them that, and they say, oh, I kind of think that's useful, I might want to do that one day. So you start with something big, uh, has big impact, uh, and then you break it down into what I call dream states. Again, this is nothing special or nothing new. This is just taking standard techniques and trying to apply it to this problem. Um, but we try to figure out the dream states, and we put on different hats when we do that. In the case of online healthcare, you know, I might take the role of a patient, and I say, what's my dream state? Well, maybe my dream state is, ooh, maybe I'm traveling somewhere and I get injured, and uh, oh, I'm allergic to some special, so certain drugs, and so when the doctors find me, they're able to access some kind of special record of mine, and they don't give me a drug that would kill me. And not only that, I get better right away, and I don't get charged. That might be my dream state for the online healthcare. But uh, on the other hand, if I'm a provider or a payer, uh, I might have a different dream state around keeping my costs low, things of that nature. If I'm a regulator, maybe what I want is to hit a single button somewhere in some room and I get all the right audit reports coming in from various places and I can tell that everyone in the ecosystem is doing the right thing with the least amount of work because I'm always understaffed. And I never have the ability to do my job well. Well, what if I'm a researcher? Well, what I want to do is mine all that data <laughs> and find where the latest you know, uh, new drugs might apply or where the latest uh, diseases are happening. Uh, but I want to be able to do that in a privacy sensitive way. So everyone has a different dream state depending on the hat you put on. And it's important to identify these roles and tease them out. Because when we go out and try to you know, talk to the ecosystem, everyone has a slightly different pivot. Now once you have the dream states, you break them down to the next level of specific scenarios. Things that a person's gonna do on a daily basis. And we'll talk a little bit more about scenario development in a minute. But they're really critical because they tell the story. And once you have the story, you can now start breaking it down to the building blocks, the actual pieces it takes to make these stories happen. But what I like about this process is that 
Um, we don't start down here. A lot of people start here, they say, I've got a really great building block. You should really love this. It's like, well, what do I use it for? And how does it fit in the big picture? Uh, it's a lot easier starting up here saying, do we have a shared vision of what we want? Because so often, people's having a dialogue here immediately get up here and they don't have any common ground. So we kind of like going from this direction whenever possible. And of course, iterating. But at this point, now we can maybe tease out the set of building blocks that are necessary and map them out over time and actually see what we've got. Um, these could be examples of things like needing in-person proofing or safe harbor, public policies, et cetera. So when we develop scenarios, we use this acronym. Um, we specifically try to stay out of implementation. We don't try to enumerate how it's getting done. This lets a lot more variety of solutions to show up. I mean, this is not about Windows solutions or Microsoft solutions, it's about ecosystem solutions. There's so many different ways to solve these problems. Uh, some of them might be open source, it doesn't really matter. It's whatever it takes to solve the problem. Um, and you keep it out of your scenario development. So you tell the story, you use a lot of personal details, you always speak as if you're the person who you're doing the scenario for, and there has to be some real research behind, do people really want this? Does this really map well? And it has to be emotional. So here's an example, I'm not gonna read through it, but this kind of almost you know, runs through the little script I gave you about being on a trip and finally getting better at the end of the day. So you can build these scenarios out. Now, with respect to initiatives, uh, again, they're just tools for framing the discussion. Um, you could have 10 initiatives, you could have two. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we picked these four because they kind of covered most of the space. The first is the online healthcare one I, I mentioned. And there's always a little tagline about needing to say, manage the privacy risk that everybody cares about. When you get to sort of e-commerce and facilitating that, most of the people there care more about reducing the fraud. Although you'll find there's a lot of commonality between these two building blocks that are, are necessary. Uh, a lot of people in the government circles are really afraid of cyber attacks and cyber warfare, espionage. You see a lot of this in the news right now. And so protecting critical infrastructure, uh, really, really hot topic. But you've got to be really careful when you do this because you don't want to erode those personal freedoms. Uh, this is you know, absolutely critical that we get this right and build in at the beginning the ability to possibly de-link uh, information. Because once things are linked up, it's almost impossible to pull them apart. And we see a lot of calls for like a national strategy for secure online transactions, which is now called NSTIC. Uh, but they are out there trying to figure out how to build that out, and if we don't provide the input right now to tell them to keep it in balance with these other abilities to say do minimal disclosure or uh, the ability not to link uh, and de-link data, you won't be able to do it later. And finally, another one that's uh, kind of interesting is secure online collaboration between virtual organizations. This is sort of the new way to do business out there. You see it in pharma, you see it in uh, aerospace, uh, you've got governments, you've got uh, private and public enterprises trying to work together. And quite frankly, the problem in that space, if I had to pick a tagline, it's managing the distrust between parties. I think, you know, trying to increase trust is really not always the right goal. And in many ways, it's managing the level of distrust to a, to a point or a level of risk that you're willing to go through with the transaction. That's more realistic, actually. And so you've got these companies that are potentially competitors with each other who need to collaborate. So they want to share enough to get it to happen, but they don't want to share too much of their, their trade secrets. So uh, one of these entities, uh, as an example for secure collaboration, is the TSCP, which is the Trans-Global Secure Collaboration Program. And it's out there right now. It's been there out there for a couple of years. And these are all these very large entities, some of them government entities, trying to work together for you know, defense. Um, and in some cases, these guys might have a bolt and these guys might have a nut and they need to be able to put them together, but they don't want to see the engine and they want to keep people, uh, you know, to have uh, the right kind of access and control. So their requirements really push the limits of what's available right now in technology in terms of uh, being able to have fine grain access control across many things and being able to redact documents so you only get to see the things you're supposed to see. And they want that this to work, uh, you know, where a person has certain access, certain role, across all communication channels, whether it's email or documents or instant messaging or telephone. Uh, they would like these things to apply globally. And of course the challenge here is that this is of course by definition cross-organization and also cross-platform. There's all sorts of stuff in here, Linux and Windows and whatnot. It's gonna require all those other kinds of uh, strategies that we have at least uh, academically tried to figure out before but maybe not seen in products. So here is a roadmap for secure collaboration. And don't worry about the complexity. I just want to give you a quick tour of the colors and what they mean. 
Uh, off on the far right are the dream states. And you can't read it, but they're actually teased out by different roles in that ecosystem, including the knowledge worker and people who do audit and various other functions. A bunch of representative scenarios are listed here. And this isn't just something we made up. We actually went to TSCP, and we've been with them for a couple of years now. And they have helped us uh, educate us on what are their dream states, what are their scenarios. So this is now like version four of this document. So it's not just something that's just a guess. It's kind of like, well, they're beginning to say it smells like them that it actually represents what they think they want. Um, so after the scenarios, you have all these building blocks sitting out here on the, right hand, on the left hand side. Now the building blocks come in different colors. Uh, in particular, the blue ones are technology building blocks that need to get done. Uh, the green ones with the little books are standards that need to get established. And these guys, the ones that might look yellow to you with a little house is the public policy ones. And what's kind of cool about this kind of visualization is just simply having those three different types of domains represented on the same space. And in fact, trying to illustrate the true dependencies of these different pieces. And as we built this out, we were noticing some strange things. Number one, that public policy often is not a direct dependency issue. What happens is, is you'll notice there are often dashed lines in this picture. And you can't read the word, but it's an accelerator. So if you had the public policy, it possibly could accelerate this to happen. Of course, bad public policy could decelerate something from happening. So again, if, if you're trying to get the full ecosystem engaged and you've got people in public policy saying, what can we do? Because we don't quite understand the technology, but tell us what you need. Um, this is really valuable to them because they see where they show up and when they need to do the work. Um, this has given us an opportunity to have all sorts of dialogues at all sorts of different levels, uh, nationally and internationally. Um, I shared this with uh, BMI, the, the German interior. They love the fact that we were trying to look out over the next couple of hills, because often they're stuck at a single building block focusing on like just creating a digital credential. And that's the only thing they're focused on, but they're not focused on any of the other pieces that are necessary to carry the rest of the ecosystem. So let's look at the rest of this picture in a little more detail. Let's pick a single scenario. I simplified it down. This guy just simply wants to share some documents with other people using some common taxonomy so they all know vault's a vault. And they, they gotta be able to do it regardless of the application. Uh, and here are all the building blocks that tease out from that scenario. And if you actually start to read through these, you'll notice they'll clump into certain functions. The first top is all about identity claims, making claims about identity. Uh, the middle set have to do with the access policies related to those identities and some way of universally representing those. There's a whole suite of them related to machine health. This is the whole concept of sort of the WHO model for computers where, I mean the World Health Organization model for computers where you know, if you have a community, you may not want a particular computer onto the, into that community if it's been affected. I mean, we, right now, as a culture, a society, believe it's okay to quarantine certain people who have certain kinds of diseases. We might feel the same way about computers. And so for these or communities that they want to make sure there's people with a certain level of, of capability or, uh, or a certain level of compliance or, or are uh, not infected, uh, the ability for those machines to make claims about their health are very critical. So this is actually a really interesting area uh, to think about. So let's blow up the one on identity claims. And you see the different colors. We don't have time to go through this at all, but I'll just pick, well, I'll just let me make this statement. If you were to read one of these up here, you'll re you realize it's very generic. This is like adoption of technology for issuing, consuming minimal disclosure claims. This is how you get uh, less shared and you get back to identity attributes and some other things for uh, preserving privacy. So that's the high level building block, but you know, what are the current projects out there right now that people could work on or are working on, and when are they coming out? So that's the project level. That's a whole other level below the building blocks. And you start to tease out what these projects are across different companies, different spaces. Now you can kind of look at the time dimension and say, well, are the right things happening at the right time? Can we nudge things along? Can we incentivize it? Maybe there's some program the government needs to do to fund something. Maybe there's research that needs to be done in terms of basic research. Uh, let's blow up that green one up on the right-hand corner. This is actually for creation and adoption of interoperability of open standards for issuing the claims for mental disclosure. And as part of that, one of the steps that we've done recently is to push UProve uh, technology that we have uh, out into uh, the public domain so that people could use it. Uh, and it's available and you know, if people want to go base standards on that, they're welcome to. It's not an issue. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we had to internally sort of come to grips with because we were holding up potentially the ecosystem by sitting on technology that people couldn't use.
So hopefully others will do the same. And then people could build proof of concepts and we can actually get going with some of this and get some experience with it. So here's uh, some on the universal policy side. Um, this one over here is in red. And the reason the star is in red, it means it's in progress, but there's something wrong. And if you blow it up, you'll realize it's stalled because there's a couple of different ways to solve the problem and there isn't always a common uh, agreement on what the best practice is. So if people could sort of get off their particular personal preferences and, and identify one and pick it, we can now run with it as a standard. So that helps. If you can start picking out where the uh, building, where the uh, roadblocks are, then you can kind of nudge those guys along too. All right, so here's a uh, roadmap we put together for online healthcare. And again, I don't want you to look at any of the details of it other than look at the topology. And I'm going to show you the one that we built for uh, financial transactions. Okay, here it comes. Watch carefully. Boy, it looks awfully similar. <laughs> and it's not a great surprise because they're both in the same class of high-valued internet transactions. Basically, it's perceived that what's transacting over the wires there is something of high value and needs to be protected a certain way. Where you start seeing differences is actually in the public policy pieces. Uh, you start to see things like uh, patient's bill of rights versus safe harbors versus other kinds of tools to make things happen. Uh, and we find that really intriguing because if we can get a group of people in one area to sort of take interest and start moving on it, you suddenly get building blocks available for other initiatives too for free. You know, I have a sort of a dream, a hidden agenda around certain building blocks on, uh, on, on personal freedoms and the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And if I were to actually create an initiative like that, I probably wouldn't get a lot of funding. But if I could draw it and I could actually identify the building blocks, maybe there's a bunch already being built for these other things that we then could reuse for that purpose. So that's kind of the, uh, the way you can think about using some of these, these roadmaps. It's pretty interesting. OK, so if you were to look at all the stuff that we've done so far and group all the different uh, types of building blocks we've seen, this is totally arbitrary. But we created about mm, seven different families of building blocks. I mentioned the ones relating to health, system and device health. There's a whole bunch relating to identity and claims about that identity and the authorization and, and authentication requirements for that. There's a whole set of things around rules-based access and universal policy. Uh, in particular, I, I'd pick this one as a really rich research area. Um, as there's this greater desire for the fine-grained control over things, it's going to be unmanageable by humans to basically tag things and label things at that level. It's just going to be so laborious. So tools that automatically tag intelligently based on context are clearly a big research area here. And I see this happening more and more and more. We'll have requirements for the granularity, but we need the usability. Uh, and it's going to come through really interesting architectural solutions for how to do this. Uh, the ability to do reputation, you need to know th uh, things beyond some of the uh, self-asserted stuff. Uh, being able to verify how bad things happen once they hit afterwards through auditing. And there's a couple of, of families that I'll call horizontals that affect everything in the whole ecosystem. One is the trust user experience, uh, which has to do with the hot seat problem, uh, the usability of these things. Uh, anytime there's a UI involved. And the other is the uh, software assurance and, and integrity layer uh, about supply chain and things of that nature. You really need to know where this stuff has gone through and whether there was a chain of custody and whether you can trust the actual components. So uh, at this point, I'm going to focus a little bit here on this uh, tuck stuff and give you a feel for what that's about. So I mentioned since when you're in the hot seat, uh, and this happens quite often. Uh, every time from uh, whether you're at the right place when you're trying to do some kind of banking transaction to whether you've got links in your email and whether you can click on them. Uh, this middle one, should I share my data, is going to come up again and again and again. Um, we have so many new cloud-based services emerging, some having to do with healthcare, and third parties are going to want to monetize your sensitive health records. And they're going to knock on your door with a horse trade and they're going to say, hey, would you mind sharing this data? And you're going to have to figure out whether that's okay or not. We also have people in uh, social networks making big mistakes here as well, not forming the right mental models around um, who gets the data, whether they're truly a friend or not, and who's in a friend or a friend of a friend. Uh, setting the right permissions, this actually hits a lot of places, but it also hits the enterprise space, in particular uh, setting the roles-based access we talked about also. So uh, once we get through this, I think you'll agree that Tux is actually pretty hard to do and do well. Um, when we think about this tux problem, we, we look at it uh, as a triple. We think about 
the actual UI a person sees, we think about the underlying architecture, and we think about the user's mental model. When those three don't align, you get problems. You have people making silly mistakes. Um, a lot of times you'll have situations where the underlying architecture is already fixed, it's legacy, and you can't change it. So people try to make the UI look more pretty. Uh, that doesn't necessarily improve the user's mental model of what's going on. They still might very well not realize that something is safe when it isn't, um, and so on and so forth. So, quick example of bad tux and the tux challenge. Uh, here I am, I'm about to log into my bank, and uh, you know, one of the things about the identity theft work is that the root cause is not knowing who's who, so you do authentication, but the challenge is most of the time the authentication isn't mutual, it's only one way. So this is a great example of that. I log into my bank first tech, they ask for all this information, but how do I know it's them? All I get is this kind of URL up here to figure out. So the question is, well, what about that URL? Is it correct? You know, right up here it says this full name listed out, but I don't know whether that rep represents this or not. Maybe it's just arbitrary. Uh, but wait a second, I see a lock symbol, so it's gotta be safe, right? This is what most users think of. They've been told lock symbols mean security. Uh, but we know here in this room anyway that this just simply means that there's a secure connection between the two endpoints. So now you've got a secure channel to the bad guy sites. No other bad guy can steal the data they're stealing from you. Not, not terribly useful. Um, but wait a second, you know, um, you know it, it, this lock symbol, you know, if anybody can get it, you know, part of the problem is first tech, is that even spelled right? Maybe there's a dash between there. Would I even notice if there was a dash? What if it was spelled FRST? Since I've been banking with these guys, they've changed their name three times on their URL. So I don't see how an average user would ever know really what the right URL is and use that solely as the basis for the trust decision. Well, if you, could, if you could inspect the cert, maybe you could act the certificate, you might actually find something out about First Tech, like where it's located. Like, is it First Tech Croatia or First Tech Beaverton, Oregon? That would be kind of useful. So we now have to go and, and actually inspect a certificate. And does actually, does anybody know how to inspect a certificate? How do you inspect a certificate on the, on the browser today? Please, can someone tell me? Shout it out if you know. Only one person, how do you do it? No. Thanks, Josh, it was close. Um, you actually double click the lock symbol, okay? So if you double click this lock symbol, you actually get this screen, which tells you about the certificate. Now, can someone tell me where is the relative information about the organization and the location of that organization of where they are in the world? Anybody know? Issuer statement, not quite right. First off, who did the checking of this entity? Who is the actual company that's doing the checking? Secure Server Certification Authority. Does anybody know what company that is? That's VeriSign. Now back when I grabbed this off the web, that's how they used to publicize themselves. So you know, if you thought VeriSign did good checking, how would you know it was even VeriSign? Well, their issue a statement will tell you what they checked and how much was paid for this kind of certificate. You know, there's a class three certificate which is for banks and it's really expensive, they do a lot of checking, but how would you know that as a user unless you got to this level and read the issuer statement which is a legalese document? Well, anyway, let's just skip over all that. Let's just pretend you know what you're doing here. Um, so you can't really know whether you, you have this branded. There is this details tab, that's kind of intriguing. So let's click on that and see if we can find the, where this thing is located. Aha, we now can see all the fields in the certificate. Can someone tell me what field in the certificate carries the location information of the place that's been checked, of where they're located? Does anybody know? Okay, it's the subject field, and if you double click the subject field, you get this set of values. Organization, First Tech Credit Union, Location, Beaverton, State, Oregon, Country, US. This is the most relevant trust information of the entire web right here, five levels deep in the interface. All right, that scares the shit out of me. I don't know about you. But this is just really way too hard, right? This is why we have a tux problem, because the trust information's buried here. And it's not even clear you could trust these fields. Are these self-asserted fields in the certificate? Or were they actually checked by the certificate authority? Well, guess what? You know, Verisign might charge $1,000 for their certificate. Well, what about GoDaddy that charges $19.99? Do you think they check these fields? Do you think they drive by this location to verify it's there? No, they don't. All they need to do is just verify that you own the path, the URL. So this information could be garbage anyway. So the question is, how do you make this easier for users? Well, this is a tux challenge. So what we did is we spent maybe two years with the other browser vendors and all the CAs, all the certificate authorities to come up with a new standard 
called extended verification certificates. Has anyone ever seen this green bar? Okay, does anybody know what it means? What, what, what does the green bar mean? Okay, great, another tux problem. So green bars mean there's an extended verification certificate in play, a special certificate that PayPal bought that all the certificate authorities are guaranteed to do a minimal level of checking. Drive by of the location, make sure they've got money in the bank, make sure the person who's asking for it isn't the mailroom clerk, but someone's actually gonna take a fall if there's a problem, like uh, their legal counsel or their CEO. Right? So some high level person in the company is the one who gets it issued, and so all this checking's been done. Now all the browser vendors said, if we ever encounter one of these EV certs, we will color it differently, we'll present it differently in the UI, it's green, and we'll also populate at the very top level the name of the entity and where it's located so you don't have to go five levels deep. We, we would like to believe this is trust at a glance, right? Clearly, in a, a, what could be perceived as an improvement if you knew the semantics. So now that you all now understand the semantics of the green bar and that it's a shorthand, the next time you encounter one of these, you can say, wow, that's great. I can now just click away because I know exactly what this is and it really is my bank. But then the bad guys come in and they do one of these little tricks. This is a picture of picture attack. And we actually did a study where Everything in this window over here, as you know, is arbitrary. It's just pixels drawn by this website. All this is arbitrary. And so this is actually evil paypal.com up here. No green bar, no lock symbol. And they put you a picture of a green bar with a lock symbol. And 40% of the people who I just gave the, the talk to now think this is safe and click away and put in their password. So we have a fundamental problem here. This is the trusted pixels problem or the providence of a pixel. And the problem is, is that um, everything up in here is special to the designers. It's called the Chrome of the UI. It's where you put your security indicators, here and down here. And this other little bar going around the side is all special. But all of this inside is arbitrary. Now how many users really understand that? And can they pick and, and, and distinguish between these arbitrary pixels and these pixels that are special? Quite frankly, as designers, most designers delude themselves into thinking users can tell the difference semantically of one set of symbols from another. And it's worse, a lot of websites will actually take lock symbols and put them gratuitously all over the page, sometimes without any SSL at all, any kind of security. And that further dilutes whatever values they have. So Tux is a really hard problem. We have to get away from all this. We have to use real science to figure out what works for people, what doesn't work for people. Clearly, this is an interesting risk. Uh, does anyone bank at uh, Bank of America? Okay. Um, they have this cool little feature called uh, Site Key, which gives you a visual secret. Okay, so the idea is you pick some visual secret that's unique to you, and when you log in the next time, you're supposed to see this secret and feel really good and comfortable that you're at the right site and it's not a bad guy. Right. So the researcher, this is Stuart Schechter over in MSR, and, and some of his colleagues, instead of putting up the picture, they put up this little thing. Bank of America is currently upgrading our award-winning Psyche feature. Please contact customer service if your Psyche does not reappear within the next 24 hours. Of all their subjects, 92% gave their credentials to the bad guy. <laughs> so what does this tell you from a Tux perspective? It says that the absence of a visual secret has no efficacy. People don't recognize the absence of something. Uh, and so it really doesn't have a lot of value. And of course, you've asked Bank of America about why do you keep using it as a security feature. It says, oh, it's not a security feature. It just makes our users feel better. It doesn't make them safer. So um, a lot of research, still opportunity here, trying to figure out what kinds of tools can we offer people that give them higher confidence of, of making trust decisions. So the vision for Tux, for consumers anyway, is how do you make them safer and more confident while not distracting them from enjoying their digital lifestyle? And I say this, it's really important because security and privacy are not primary tasks for users, most consumers. It's the last thing they wanna do. They wanna chat with friends, they wanna go online, they wanna watch a movie. They do not wanna set up their security. So how do you then get them safer while not blocking them? And for businesses, if you really think about it, this has been a disaster. I mean. All email that I get, I'm supposed to ignore all the links that are in that email. So my bank can't even communicate with me. They say, please go to our website so we can have a dialogue. So you get a walled garden situation. Uh, and clearly, when bad tuxes occur, not just for consumers, but you can imagine a bad tux for an enterprise where um, you're doing some kind of roles-based access and you set the wrong kind of access permission, and suddenly you've breached a million records. 
So the scale factors are huge in an enterprise for bad talks for administrators. And I'll show you some examples of this in a minute. So there's been quite a bit of research that we've even partaken on this. There's also other groups. There's this whole uh, uh, event called SOUPS, which is actually happening this week at Microsoft on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the Symposium of Usable Privacy and Security. And the latest research in this space is actually happening right now at the Commons uh, in two days. But I'll talk about some of these things. Uh, let me pick off this expandable grid because it's really interesting. Uh, a researcher at CMU, his name's Rob Reeder, for his thesis, he said, I'll take a look at the uh, access control editor in Windows for setting permissions. And he realized that there's some really funny semantics here when you can allow something and deny something, and when you're also part of a group or an individual. And so when you have any combinations of these two concepts, it becomes really hard for the average user to figure out what's going on. And it actually takes 19 separate screens to do an action where you're trying to get the permissions to be correct. I'm just going to fly through this. So first you have to inspect the actual permissions the user has. Then you've got to figure out what groups they're in. Then you've got to figure out what permissions that group has. Then you've got to go in and actually change the permissions. And then you've got to go back and check your work. 19 separate screens. Well, the reason this is so bad is because the key information is distributed across multiple different tools. And so while groups have one concept, individuals have another, trying to blend them together is kind of challenging. And it's really easy to make silly mistakes when you have that kind of level of complexity and, and uh, algorithms. So it would be much better if you could directly check and manage the permissions. So we came up with a really elegant solution for this. And I'm using this just as an example of what I'll call a tux pattern that might be useful to use again and again. So we came up with this thing called the expandable grid. It's pretty elegant. Uh, down one side, you have the things you're trying to manage. Uh, hierarchically, and across the top you have uh, groups and individuals hierarchically. And any time you get an intersection, it's green if you've got access, red if you don't, and yellow means that there's some mixed access. And if you want to find out why it's yellow, you can just click on the box and dive in. And once you're there, you can, at a very fine grain if you want to, give someone the permission with one click. Now, this is a lot better than 19 screens. So if you start using some uh, metrics, you start measuring stuff, you can actually say, well, how accurate is this new method over the old one? Uh, yellow is the new method, and blue is the old one. And you'll notice on the accuracy side, for some of these tasks, no one got it right. <laughs> and 61% of the people got it right. Here's 90% right, nobody got it right. Um, and uh, I've highlighted the ones that were statistically relevant. Out of the 36 different uh, possible outcomes here, 14 significant results. Uh, statistically significant, and wildly so. Uh, in the case of accuracy, way off the scale. In the case of how fast it was to do, about three times as fast. So this is big news, I think. I think if we could figure out ways to craft these cool patterns based on the kinds of actions we're trying to solve, we could reduce the silly mistakes people are making, and they'll actually enjoy using security and privacy a little more. Um, something to think about. We investigated things like secret questions. This is a Sarah Palin problem. You know, she. You know, someone broke into her account and took over her, her, uh, her information because it was like, what was your favorite sports team? And if you know anything about their location, it's very easy to guess. But some of the most statistically guessable answers are things like your grandfather's occupation, retired or dead are the two top answers. Um, favorite <laughs> historical person it would be Jesus or Lincoln or you know, uh, Martin Luther King. You could pick some of those. Uh, what's also interesting is they also checked how often people forgot their answers. Uh, so if this is what's being used as state of the art for getting back into your account as your last resort reauthentication after being blocked, this is one of the weakest th things you could possibly do. You've got to pick some of the questions uh, at the lowest ones, in particular like uh, you know, the name of your uh, old dog or something like that, something somebody's not going to guess very easily. But not your current dog, it's probably on Facebook. All right, so just to wrap up, warnings. Uh, there's so many different types of tuxes. Warnings, just one class. There's prods, there's warnings, there's consents. There's all sorts of tuxes. Um, one of the rules of thumb that we have about tuxes, no tux is good tux. If you could avoid engaging the user in the first place, that's a wonderful place to be. If you could solve it in the architecture, Godspeed. Great idea. But in general, sometimes you still have to get a warning in front of someone. So uh, if you have to warn, you should do so in such a way that by default the person is safe, and you don't interrupt them from what they're trying to do. There's nothing worse than having to stop what you're doing to actually address a warning. And this is a gold bar. You might have seen this in IE, uh, in Internet Explorer, for ActiveX controls. 
It used to be that an ActiveX control, when you visit a website, would just pop up saying, I need to be loaded, yes, no. And you had to answer it, and you couldn't go any further unless you did. Now what happens is that kind of content gets put on a gold bar and it says, hey, there is some other work you need, may want to do here, but it's optional, it's up to you. And 99% of the time you don't need that extra stuff. In the case of trying to open up a file that might have dangerous content, the strategy is put it in a sandbox and then let the person know that some things were disabled. Uh, and if they still want to get into it to really kind of look at it and they can do some additional trust uh, uh, tests, then they can enable the content. And, but don't by default just enable the content and don't block them. Because often you just want to remember what the thing was. You don't really need all the attachments and things like that. Uh, and it's really uh, frustrating for users when they can't get to what they want to do. And then if you do have to interrupt, give them some kind of realistic steps to follow. This is all about the quality of the guidance. So I'm, this is my last slide here. Uh, the open questions, I think, for the research community in, in Tuxland, there's quite a few of them. And if you go to the conference, you'll hear a lot more. Um, but one of the questions was, even if we were to provide an interruptive warning that was well written and actionable, would people actually respond to it in such a way that it would avoid attacks? And you know, what's the true efficacy of a warning? And how often does it really play into to, uh, safer uh, results? Um, and also, for a class of users, what can we realistically ask them to figure out? Um, and then finally, you know, when should we warn versus just take an action? There's this whole idea that uh, if, you, if a person is not going to be well equipped to answering the question, just don't ask them. And that either means don't ask them because you're going to take an action or don't ask them because you won't take an action. And what's the liability of not taking an action when you knew there was a risk? Uh, but it isn't helping just popping warnings in front of people that they can't act on. So these are the open research areas. I'll add two more to the list. This is one of my favorite. Uh, what is the sweet spot for informed consent and how do we get there? How many people have actually read their EULAs and privacy statements when they pop up saying, click here to say you've read 45 pages of content? Clearly, informed consent doesn't work, all right? Yeah, feel safe for not reading them. Yeah, feel safe for not reading them. So the question is, what's the sweet spot? Well, if you're the person who's trying to offer the service, you love it when people don't read it. So your sweet spot's probably right where it is right now. But as a consumer or a person who's getting the service, what do you want to know about the horse trade? What is useful to you to assess whether it was in your best interest or not. And this is one of the Tux metrics, which is measuring regret, which is after you learn about the behavior of a consent experience you said yes to, would you have wished you had said no? That's about the only way you can measure some of these things. And it's kind of interesting stuff. So I'd love people to get more into this and get us to a point where informed consent actually means something. And finally, how do we facilitate minimal disclosure? There's a lot of desire here to preserve privacy, of only sharing the minimal amount of data across a, a trust boundary, but how do you present that? And how do you get a user to selectively choose attributes about their identity at granularities that make sense? Right now, almost all the, the patterns we've seen for this kind of UI have failed. And people haven't figured out how to actually pass over that transom with the right information. And so they're still passing too, many, too much data. So anyway, this is just some of those open things. So thank you so much for your time. If you want to read more about end-to-end -end trust, there's a whole website on that. Uh, the SOUPS conference is actually starting on Wednesday. There's tutorials, I believe, and then the actual paper sessions uh, fri uh, Thursday and Friday. And if you want to actually collaborate on any of this or you want to take a look at those roadmaps and provide some feedback, feel free to contact me and we'll can see if we can work something out. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.